Hey there, YouTubers. This is Kevin for the Bat Productions, and welcome to another House of the Dragon video. Now, today we're going to be talking about episode nine, and there's a lot to unpack about this wacky beat the clock thriller that takes place after the death of King Viserys with lots of intrigue and even a bit of foot play, which I did not expect to be talking about. But here we are. So, as a warning, this is a spoiler alert for the events up to and including episode 9 of House of the Dragon. So you can watch this video after you see the episode and get all of its greatness. All right, so in this episode, it's focused almost entirely on Aegon II's ascension to the Iron Throne and how the High Towers are choosing to handle it. Otto and Alicen call the King's Council together, where Alicent and Otto intend to install Aegon to the Iron Throne. Alicent brings her secret. She incorrectly breaks the news to the Council, that King Viserys' dying wish was to see Aegon on the Iron Throne. And we all know that's not necessarily true. Viserys was talking about Aegon the Conqueror, not her Aegon. Quickly, however, they kind of get over that real fast, and Alicent finds out that her father has been dealing behind her back by getting most of the council on his side to install Aegon, no matter what Viserys was going to say on his deathbed. And everyone agrees, they're all on board, except for poor Lord Beesbury, whose skull is bashed in by Sir Kristen Cole. That poor wily old guy has been saying some wild stuff this entire season, and when it came down to brass tacks, he was like, no, King Viserys was my bud. He would never have done that, and you know, he's totally right, but unfortunately he had to die. It's so wild because they were left to plan a legit coup while the old man Beesbury is bleeding on the table. Alison draws a line on killing Rhaenyra and her kids. Alicent isn't a murderer and still loves Rhaenyra to some degree, so she wasn't down for it. Now, this was a super interesting scene because, by all accounts in the Fire and Blood book, this conversation didn't happen this way. Now, I'm not saying it didn't happen at all. I'm just saying that in George's source material, it was much simpler than this. For example, poor Beesbury died by having his head smashed into the table, but in Fire and Blood, by using a few different accounts, they said that he either died by getting his throat cut or he was thrown from a window. Turns out, he just got his head smashed into a table. So we know that Otto and Alicent were actually on totally different pages as to how to proceed with crowning Aegon, even though they both believe that he needed to sit the throne. And we didn't know that they had such conflict from Fire and Blood, so this was a good way to flesh it out, honestly. It gets pretty serious because when Otto suggests sending a hit squad essentially to kill Rhaenyra on Dragonstone, that's when the Lord Commander Westerling resigned his station from the Kingsguard and left to be found later on in the story a la Sir Barristan. We don't know exactly where he's going to go, but I'm sure we'll see Westerling once again. Then it becomes basically a giant race to track down the man of the hour, Aegon, who has snuck out of the Red Keep seemingly to escape his responsibilities. And it comes down to Otto versus Alicent. Who can get Aegon and leverage him in order to fix their own agenda? And this is one of the rare times where I'm going to be supporting Alicent because I don't want Otto to get a hold of him. Not at all. Alicent goes and finds Helena, who is, as usual, cross-stitching something about bugs while talking to her children, Jaehaerys and Jahera, about the Targaryen ways, just kind of in a general sense, and gives their own spooky prophetic saying, The beast is beneath the floorboards. Sp Spooky language, but she has shown she's a legit dreamer, so I think it's important that we have to sit here and listen to what her words are from now on. And if you haven't already, it's it's probably going to give you a lot of clues to the future of the series. And of course, this one comes true later on in the episode, but we'll talk about it then. Since Aegon can't be found, Otto sends the Cargill twins, Eric and Arik. Yeah, I know. It's confusing. They named them almost identically the same thing. Alicent, as a checkmate, sends her Kristen Cole and Aemon Targaryen. By the way, every scene I see with Aemond, I just think he's a budding serial killer. I swear to God, his teeth are like always clenched together whenever he's doing anything. He just seems angry all the time. The dude is going to get an ulcer if he's not careful at this rate. Anyway, they have to do a dirty deal with Daemon's old concubine and mysterious woman, Mysaria, the White Worm, who knows where Aegon is currently and has him hidden in a sept. Mysaria only wants to meet with the top man, wants to meet with Otto. When she finally does, she lets Otto know that she's for real. She already knew the king was dead, which no one should have known, really. I'm assuming it's thanks to Alicent's handmaiden using an intricate system of candle lighting. Like, for example, Talia ends up lighting three candles. That means the king is, like, sleepy or something. Lights four candles, that means they're dead. Two? Um, he's watching sports. You know, like that kind of system. So I think Masari and Talia kind of had that worked out. And that gave her incredible leverage in negotiations with Otto. And the thing that she asked for really in exchange for information on Aegon, Mysaria demanded that Otto look into ending these child fighting pits that are located in Flea Bottom. The Cargill twins ran into one of these pits. And that's where they take little kids, they file down their nails and their teeth to a point so they can essentially have death matches. I do think this is fun in a way 
Because for book readers, I couldn't help but think about maybe this is where the biter came from, from the A Song of Ice and Fire books. Because it makes sense, his teeth were filed down as well. So that was something to think about, maybe a little Easter egg or a nod to that. Both sets of trackers find Yegan, drunk out of his skull beneath an altar, literally trying to run away, which causes the Cargols and Kristen Cole and Eamon to fight and all that stuff. I mean, this guy really just wants no part of ruling, which in a way I, I pity him, honestly, but at the same time, he's, I don't know, cowardly running away from his responsibilities, which is not cool. Long term, the most insightful thing about this scene was probably the difference between the Cargill twins. We met them very quickly. They're twins. They're both on the Kingsguard. But you could see that one was not cool with some of the stuff going on and the other one was. You could see a bit of a splinter. And that gets more obvious later, of course, as Rainies, who had been locked away during Otto and Allison's shenanigans earlier in the episode. She was ushered out of the Red Keep by Eric Cargill. Eric with an E. But Rainey's story does not end there for this episode. Stay tuned because she comes back with a big bang. Allison is, is tired of keeping her dad at bay, but her time with creepy folks isn't done that day. She returns to her chambers where Laris the Clubfoot is waiting for her. And he tells her that, listen, he knows that in the Red Keep, there are spies, specifically ones that belong to Mysaria, and that Otto has been letting it happen. Alcent is just not happy about that. He even offers to shut the network down by killing Mysaria through his normal dubious light things on fire way, the Clubfoot special. However, it doesn't seem to be something he's going to do out of the goodness of his heart. It appears they have a relationship set up where Allison seemingly has to entice him by showing her feet to Laris, which I guess makes sense if you're going to be into something sexually that's kind of weird. A guy named the Clubfoot who's used to seeing ugly feet is going to be turned on by some really pretty feet. I, I guess that makes sense, but he's a foot guy and it's just, it's weird. And a lot of people, that's probably the biggest thing that everyone took away from this episode, even more than the children who were literally killing themselves with sharpened teeth and claws. The foot thing is really what everyone wants to talk about, and I'm one of them. I think it's interesting not just because they officially worked a Tarantino-style foot close-up into House of the Dragon, but because, once again, it shows no matter how self-righteous, well-intentioned Allison seems to be, she always seems to be willing to compromise on something or, or pay a price in order to gain an advantage. She slept with Viserys just to be queen. She uses Kristen's feelings for her to do evil things. And now... She's given her exclusive OnlyFans link to Laris in order to find out the info she wants. I mean, she can continue to wear that seven-pointed star all she wants, but she's not as righteous as she believes. And for you fans at home that feel bad for Allison, no, she's bad too. Anyway, let's get on to Aegon's coronation day. Aegon's dragged to his coronation against his will in a carriage, where he clearly had been either, like, drunk, high, and or crying all the way there. This kid just doesn't want to rule. He's never wanted to rule, and he has to anyway. And I know he's not a good guy, but... In so many ways, I feel so much for him, at least up till episode nine. After this, I'm not going to speak past that. But to episode nine, he feels his father never loved him. He knows Viserys never named him heir, even though for some reason, after he saw Viserys' dagger, that affected him in some big way where he maybe changed his mind on that. And yet he must usurp his sister Rhaenyra. And it's not fair to him. It's like a diamond cage. Like, yeah, okay, it's made of diamond, but it's still a cage. I will say, though, crowning him with Aegon the Conqueror's crown and giving him the ancestral Targaryen sword of Blackfire was a brilliant decision by Allison. If they want to put on a show, which is exactly what they did, they put on a pretty good show with all the witnesses seeing those two great relics ahead of Rhaenyra's coronation. It was really an attempt to empower the people to support Aegon as heir instead of Rhaenyra and say, this is the guy. We already did it first. Sorry, bro, but look how strong he looks. He's wearing the Conqueror's stuff. And I found this scene really beautiful because even though, again, Aegon is kind of a bad dude, you could see that Aegon really gained what he felt was real love and support for the first time in his life. It explains so much about his character. He felt his dad didn't like him. His mother just used him to be a future king. His brother was too intense for him at basically all times. He couldn't relate to his sister, even though he was forced to marry her. And his grandfather, Otto, clearly thought he was a disappointment and a jerk. I mean, see the way he treated him on Driftmark? Again, I know he sexually assaulted that poor girl in episode eight, and he's, he's a jerk. He's a bad guy for that. But he's clearly using alcohol and sex and shenanigans to cover up the absolute lack of affection growing up. And every kid is built differently, and he's just one that needs something different than Aemond and Helena compared to what he got. Again, not excusing the sexual assault. I cannot say that enough. He is one of the worst people on the show, but it's important to understand why some people are the way they are. Like, there were times where he tried to be himself just a little bit, and Allison smacked him and said, no, you must be this. So the dude effectively has been trapped for a very long time, and he's finally having his moments with the people and enjoying it because the love of the people in the pit, it just felt real. 
Now, of course, that plan got busted up really quickly when Rainies, who had been watching the crowd, literally bust through the floor of the pit where they were meeting with her dragon Meleys and killed a ton of civilians, which that opens up a whole bag of cats as far as how it's gonna look with the greens versus the blacks, because Rainies did just kill a bunch of civilians. And we all know how people feel about Targaryens just randomly killing civilians with dragons. Thank you, Dan and Dave. Now, obviously, like many of you out there, I said, is this the beast beneath the floorboards? I'd have to say, you know, it probably is. Although there was a moment in earlier in the episode when I thought Helena was giving Alicent maybe a clue that Aegon was hiding underneath the altar in the Seps. You know, a beast, a dragon, under the floorboards, under some wood, which makes up the altar. I thought maybe that'd be the case, but that's probably not true, and honestly, this works better. The most disappointing part, though, was Rhaenys has the chance to Dracarys the entire Targaryen green side. You have Otto, you have Alicent, you have Aemon, Aegon, Helena, Kristen, all of them, but she didn't do it because she looked at the eyes of Alicent, and her weakness really showed. This, this has to be the result of Rhaenys losing her whole family, and she felt pity when she looked at Alicent, and she saw that Alicent was about to lose her entire family. So I think she felt bad in that moment, but sadly, because that happened, she could have saved countless lives, and she didn't. She flies away, making haste for Dragonstone to alert Rhaenyra, who likely doesn't know anything about what's happened with this coronation of Aegon II. She doesn't even know if Viserys is dead yet at this point. But when she does, war is going to begin. I mean, we spent the whole episode with the Targaryen greens, but I'm happy to say that next week, we'll likely get to see a ton of the Targaryen blacks and Daddy Damon Targaryen. So I'm really stoked about that. It looks like he's gonna venture and try to bond with or tame a dragon that is located in one of the caves in Dragonstone. My guess is that's probably Vermithor which is the dragon of King Jaehaerys. Right now, it doesn't have a rider. It's one of the largest in the world, and it's battle-tested, so that would be a great ally to get. It will be interesting because we know that Daemon already has a dragon in Caraxes, but maybe similar to Daenerys, who only rode Drogon, but Viserion and Rhaegal flew with them, maybe his plan is to ride Caraxes and have Vermithor with him. That'd be really cool, and that's going to be a huge get for the Targaryen Blacks, if so. This episode was a solid eight and a half, to me because it was heavy on intrigue, Melee's bust through the door, which was really cool, and Rainey's with the war armor, which I really appreciated, but I don't know how she spent the time to put on the armor. Anyway, but that's something for another day. And it fleshed out Fire and Blood more, which I'm a big fan of that. Also, I loved Eamon's jealousy of Aegon throughout the episode. Him wishing it was him as heir, but trying not to lose his mind like at all times, like freaking out the fact that Aegon got the girl he wants, he clearly likes Helena, and he got the throne that he wants, and Aegon doesn't want it. So there's that weird fact where Aemon just absolutely is upset with Aegon. But he muscles through it because he apparently is a dutiful man. And that's going to do it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed episode 9 of House of the Dragon. If you want to read the source material, which is Fire and Blood, I have the audiobook, kind of an amateur narration on this channel. I'll link it here in the video so that you can listen to that. And if you enjoyed that and or this video, please hit the subscribe button. Again, I don't do a Patreon because I don't want your money. I do want your subscription there to this channel so you can keep watching content and keep conversing with me because that's what I really appreciate um, a whole lot from people in this community. Otherwise, hope you have an amazing day, everybody. You take care and bye, bye, bye.